Hi everybody. We're just just going to get started now, so hopefully everybody is ready. Um, my name is Alec Conan, and I'll be introducing the speakers today. Uh, I want to start by thanking you all for being here and thanking Reverend Mo and everyone at First Church for supporting uh, the work that is being done here and for allowing us use of this space. Um, We are all here today because we believe in greenhouse gas emissions reductions targets that are based on climate science. We are all here today because we believe that our children and future generations have a constitutional right to clean air and a stable climate. As I'm sure many of you are aware, over the last couple of years, eight Washington children, eight Washington youth, have sued the state's Department of Ecology for failing to come up with reductions targets that are based on science, for failing to implement laws that protect their constitutional right to clean air and a stable climate. As a result of that court case, earlier this year, the Department of Ecology was ordered to promulgate a rule capping and regulating the state's emissions by the end of 2016. In June, they released that revised clean air rule. And unfortunately, it's very clear that It both fails to implement carbon reduction targets that are based on science and that protect our future generation's right, constitutional right to clean air and a stable climate. And that's that's why we're here today, because we are calling for more, we're calling for greater ambition, and we have uh, five people here who are going to talk to that in a variety of ways. Our first speaker, who I'd like to introduce, is Jill Mangaliman, who is the Executive Director of Got Green, which is a people of colour-led environmental justice group based in South Seattle. Um, and I'd like to welcome Jill. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you all um, for coming out here today. Uh, I'm, I'm here on behalf of Got Green. Um, I first wanted to say that I'm especially um, proud of the youth who have led the charge uh, for climate justice, for calling uh, for uh, more uh, powerful uh, legislation that will um, protect our our planet and our people. Um, And again, like, it's always the youth who are leading the charge, and I I thank you for all your work. Um, The Clean Air Rule had the potential to do something significant for our state, for our region. Um, Unfortunately, uh, it fails at climate justice and racial justice. Got Green um, joined a group called Something Centered and in the summer of 2014 developed climate justice criteria that we presented to legislators in Olympia um, and also nationally. Um, The the criteria goes as follows. Equity must be at the center of policies to address climate change because communities of color and low-income communities are hit first and worst by this, this uh, <clears throat> by climate change, by this uh, calamity that is uh, uh, approaching our planet and, and is happening now. These policies and implementations approaches must be informed by these communities and have a racial, economic, and environmental analysis. And those communities who are most impacted by climate change must be fully engaged in the policy process and design to ha- ensure equitable outcomes. Um, unfortunately, the, the clean air rule was done without that. Uh, we had one stakeholder meeting um, as a coalition, um, and then there was a hearing uh, in Tumwater. And not once did we see uh, an effort um, for, from the Department of Ecology or from the governor's uh, 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 administration to go to those communities to where the Superfund sites were, where people were suffering from asthma, where people were suffering from um, wildfires and heat waves uh, or flooding. Um, and so we, we see this, uh, this lack of meaningful engagement, uh, one of the major risks of how this policy was constructed. Without the people who are most impacted, how are we to know that these solutions will actually reach them? Um, the next criteria is that these uh, communities, these EJ communities, people of color and low-income um, communities must receive net environmental economic benefits. 
Where in this policy are there reinvestments in these communities? Where in, these, where in this legislation are there resources for these communities to uh, transition to renewable economy? Um, as we know that as we pass uh, climate policies, harms and, and, and the cost burden will be passed on to the most vulnerable. How do we ensure that the, the, these uh, policies don't do further harm to already marginalized communities? Um, and so we are calling on the Department of Ecology and the, and the governor to really you know, do, do their analysis and tracking and reach out to these communities and ensure that there is a way for these communities to be lifted up. Um, and furthermore, you know, we, we also see that there's a need for um, a accountability and transparency through public and accessible, culturally appropriate participation and strong enforcement. Um, we know that you know, for the longest time there are a lot of companies here in, 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 in Washington State. Um, how do we ensure that the status quo doesn't continue? How do we ensure that there are, are, are uh, reductions of emissions on the ground and that people who live near those, uh, who live on the fence line of these companies or these highways or these places of high emissions are actually um, getting relief um, and also are you know, having better air and, and having access to this healthier, uh, greener world. And so we want to ensure that, again, the people who have been left out of public process, the people who have been without resources historically, people of color, low-income people, indigenous people, um, have access to this, to this transition uh, that we are seeing in our economy. And so we ask that you know, this clean air rule uh, become stronger, that it um, uh, directs its investments and directs a priority to reducing emissions at the source in communities of color and low-income communities and historically uh, uh, sites of, of high pollution. We, we ask that you know, the, the Department of Ecology and, and the governor engage with us meaningfully, like go to where we are and meet with us here in South Seattle, South King County and in Pierce County where communities live. Um, and we ask for racial justice and climate justice because we can't um, pass policies without that. Um, and so we need to ensure that, again, we're not replicating the systems that we are fighting. And so I, I am here in solidarity with the youth. I'm in solidarity with all of you because I want to see a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Bruce Amundsen, who is the president of Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. So we're pleased to be here, and I'd like to address some of the health issues that these youth are trying to head off. Uh, environmental, political, and health leaders in Washington are making major efforts to reduce our state's greenhouse gas emissions. We at WPSR deeply appreciate the relentless leadership of Governor Inslee, the greenest governor in the U.S., to try to address our overheating planet. But we agree that the Department of Ecology's proposed clean air rule is not sufficient to confront the looming catastrophe of a warming planet. Climate change is already occurring and producing severe health effects on the natural world and on human health. Although uncertainties remain regarding health risks, Failure to take prompt action, given our current knowledge, would be an act of injustice to everybody, especially children. Here's why. It's quite simple. According to the World Health Organization, more than 88% of the existing burden of disease attributable to climate change occurs in children younger than five. Children represent a uniquely vulnerable group. Let's look again at some, let's look at some of the major health risks from climate change and especially how they impact children. Extreme weather events, severe storms, floods, and wildflowers, wildfires have increased markedly over the last 40 years. These extreme events directly threaten all those exposed with injury and death. But they pose special risks to children. Extreme weather events place children at greater risk of injury, but kids also experience frequent loss of their parents, and the terror of separation from their caregivers. They also faced a high risk of mental health problems, such as depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Further, major weather disasters cause irrevocable harm to children through devastation of their homes, their schools, and their neighborhoods, all of which can impact both the physical and cognitive development of kids. 
Then we have heat waves. Children suffer directly from the increased severity of heat waves. There's an increase in child morbidity and mortality during extreme heat events, especially for kids under one year of age. Pay attention to this. There is a greater than 90% chance that by the end of the 21st century, average summer temperatures will exceed the highest temperatures ever recorded in many regions of the world. Average temperatures will be the highest. Putting great, greatly putting families and kids at risk. The eastern part of our state, already experiencing very high temperatures, will clearly be impacted. A secondary effect of rising temperatures is reduced air quality. Our air quality is reduced because of greater ozone concentrations at ground level, higher pollen counts, longer allergy seasons, and smoke from wildfire, wildfires, which has already become a health problem for kids in Washington. All of these aggravate respiratory diseases and especially asthma in children. Washington commends the children of Washington who are leading this campaign. Their advocacy could improve health prospects for children all across the globe. Kids who are being put at risk for other serious problems associated with global warming. Problems such as higher burdens of diarrheal disease, a major killer in the tropics, reduced food availability from altered agricultural production, and reduced access to clean and safe drinking water. So to that extent, Washington's children have become champions for kids across the planet. We are honored to put our support behind this initiative to pass legislation that would move our state towards science-based levels of carbon emission. Physicians expect our elected officials to respect science. Failure to accept the science behind our overheating planet has become a moral issue, not just a political one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amundsen. I'm really glad to hear Dr. Amundsen and Jill talk about the moral issue that climate change is. We had a meeting uh, a number of weeks ago now with the Governor's staff. We met with his Chief of Staff and his Senior Climate Change Policy Advisor to discuss the Clean Air Rule. And we were told that it is the clean air rule as strong as it possibly can be given existing legal realities. I think what is clear here is that the moral reality of the situation is different from the legal reality and the moral reality of this issue must overcome the legal reality. So far that is clear that is not happening. Governor Inslee ordered his Department of Ecology using his executive authority to create a rule and it falls dramatically short of the science-based reductions that we need to see. It falls dramatically short of rising to the moral reality of the challenge that faces us. According to the World Health Organization, already 150,000 people are dying every year as a result of climate change. Seven million a year are already dying as a result of air pollution. That is what I talk about when I talk about the moral reality of the crisis that we are in. So with the Department of Ecology's Clean Air Rule and the current existing laws within Washington State failing to rise to that challenge, that reality, we're looking at new ways to ensure that our state does its bit to combat the climate crisis. And one of those ways uh, is going to be talked about by our next speaker, who's 14-year-old Gabe Mandel, who's a former president of the Washington chapter of Plant for the Planet, and one of the youth plaintiffs who has been involved in the case against the Washington Department of Ecology. I'd like you to welcome Gabe to the stage, please. Sorry, Gabe is the current president of Plant for the Planet. My uh, apologies. Hi, I'm Gabe. You already heard my introduction. Uh, we all know climate change is a huge issue. And we know that if we don't reduce CO2 emissions uh, drastically, today's children will face an unlivable world. Sadly, people in government who are supposed to be protecting us still aren't doing their job. I believe you've heard about the Department of Ecology a little bit. And once again, we children must take the lead. You'll hear about 
legislation a bit from our attorney, who's my vet. And I want to tell you about another strategy, though. Since the state won't mandate that large polluters reduce CO2 emissions by science, we are sending letters to corporations and institutes with carbon footprints over 25,000 metric tons per year and asking them to work with us to reduce their carbon emissions in line with current science. We need to work together to make a better future. Here is a letter I wrote to Nucor Steel. Dear Mr. Doyle R. Simmons, or Simmons Doyle, whatever. Um, hello, my name is Gabe. I'm 14 years old, and I'm the current president of Plants of the Planet Seattle. We are a worldwide children's organization dedicated to fighting climate change. As you might be able to tell from our name, one of our goals is to plant trees, and a thousand billion by 2020, or a trillion. We children are greatly concerned about climate change because as nearly 100% of top climate change scientists agree, a warming planet will be extremely detrimental to us and to future generations. The best climate science says that we need to reduce carbon emissions globally by at least 8% per year to ensure that we can raise our own children in a safe and helpful world. We children want to work together with large companies to come up with carbon reduction plans that are good for the future and also good for business. We appreciate that, uh, oh wow, I'm reading from the wrong letter. Oh wow, this is to Weyerhaeuser, sorry. Uh, but we appreciate that, um, sorry. <laughs> We appreciate that you plant trees and then that you harvest wood from tree farms, but we ask you to commit to do more for the climate. By the way, Weyerhaeuser is a timber company. For example, you could stop clear cutting and commit to plant trees that will not be uh, cut down, but will continue to clean the air for carbon. Please decide to protect us and your children too by taking the important first step of setting up a time to talk with us and plan your contribution to a sustainable future. And I asked them to contact Aji over there. These companies will only respond, though, if we get enough people to know about this. They're not just going to willingly reduce all their carbon emissions. We need everyone to spread the word. We need the media, we need people to tell their friends. People can send letters of their own, they can call to companies that have a large carbon footprint and ask them to meet and to plan for a sustainable future. This can be a school project. This can be something you do with your family. Because this involves everybody. Because we are all the future, and the future is what's at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. As well as uh, our intention to contact every industry that emits more than 10,000 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions per year in Washington State and ask if they will work uh, with the future generations of Washington State and the youth to voluntarily reduce their emissions. We're also here to talk about legislation that would mean that Washington State's emissions reductions targets were aligned with climate science. Um, and to talk to us about that legislation um, is Andrea Rogers. And uh, before Andrea comes up, I'll just uh, let you know that following Andrea's uh, discussion of this legislation, we're going to pause for a five to ten minute Q&A um, in case anyone has any questions about the legislation so that Andrea will be able to answer your questions about this legislation. And then we'll move on to our final speaker. Um, so please welcome to the stage uh, Andrea Rogers, an attorney with Western Environmental Law Centre. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so, so much for coming today. Um, it's an honour for me to be on this stage, not only with two of my clients, but with um, some folks who are doing really remarkable things uh, in the fight for climate justice. So you've heard a little bit about the litigation, our case, that uh, Gabe and Aji and others have been involved with. And that's really where this legislation has come out of. Um, in 2008, the Washington legislature passed a statute. And in that statute, it, st it said the state shall 
reduce its greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020, um, and then sort of you would go reduce from there and you would check in 2035, they had to be reduced further, 2050, they would have to be reduced further. Now, even though the, sta the statute said the state shall, it didn't say who in the state shall be responsible for ensuring that we meet those emission reduction targets. And the Attorney General's office has essentially interpreted the statute as requiring nobody to do nothing. <laughs> so um, it's a problem. It's, it's a wonderful, it's wonderfully written statute in that it commits to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to achieve levels of global climate stability by the year 2050. Um, in addition, it directed the Washington State Department of Ecology, who you've heard about. They're the administrative agency that's charged with protecting our natural resources. They are charged with regulating air pollution and regulating water pollution and making sure that our common natural resources that are held in trust by the state of Washington are protected for future generations. The statute directed ecology to make recommendations to the legislature every time new science developed that said the, the targets need to be more aggressive. Now, in the last eight years since this statute was passed, there's been a tremendous evolution uh, of climate science. The impacts that we are experiencing are not getting better. They're, in fact, getting very wor much, very much worse. And we are f fortunate to have here in the state of Washington the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group. And they are the group of scientists who do these regular updates and telling us what are the climate impacts that we're seeing, what are we likely to see. Um, and their most, most recent report was in 2014. And it concluded that all scenarios indicate continued warming. Uh, and every report that ecology has issued on climate change has said that urgent action is needed now to draw down emissions. Uh, they have acknowledged that we are not on track to meet the emission limitations for 2020 and that more needs to be done. And as part of our case, we petitioned Ecology in 2014, asking them to use their existing authority to, to cap and regulate carbon dioxide emissions in the state. And then a very important part of our case is that we asked Ecology to make the recommendation to the legislature to update the greenhouse gas emissions based on best available science. That's been a part of our case since the very, very beginning. Now, Ecology has missed three deadlines to do that. Uh, Governor Inslee directed them to do that, to make the recommendation to the legislature in July 2014. Um, in December 2014, they issued a report to the legislature, but it contained no recommendation as to the, what the greenhouse gas emission limits should be, instead telling us to wait until Paris, that the, par the climate change talks in Paris will apparently tell us where we need to go. Well, Paris came and went. Uh, in our court case, they said they would be making the, the recommendations in the legislative session this earlier this year. That didn't happen. And so come April, uh, the court finally ordered them to make the recommendation, and they're legally obligated to make that recommendation by the end of this year in advance of the legislative session. It was our hope that we could sit down with them and bring in our team of scientific experts so that we could work with them on and develop what the recommendation to the legislature should be. Uh, the youth are very fortunate. Their lead expert in this case is Dr. James Hansen, and he and his team of experts are some of the few climate scientists that have developed what's called a scientific prescription for the planet. Essentially, they've calculated how fast and how far do we have to reduce our global carbon dioxide emissions in order to achieve 350 parts per million in global atmospheric concentrations by the end of the century. How do we do that? And they've done the mathematical formula and calculated that. And they are the ones who are helping the youth in our state develop the numbers for the state of Washington. You've heard the number 8% per year. That number has come from Dr. Hansen and his team. And the legislation that we're releasing today contains uh, recommendations that Dr. Hansen and his team calculated for Washington. So it's calibrated, taking into account Washington's fair share of greenhouse gas emissions, what we would need to do to take responsibility for our share of greenhouse gas emissions to put us on a trajectory to reach global atmospheric concentrations of 350 parts per million by the end of the century. And what our legislation is recommending is that by 2020, we will need to reduce our emissions by 10% below 1990 levels, 
by 2035, 68% below 1990 levels, and by 2050, 91% below 1990 levels, so significantly more aggressive than where we, need, where we are today. Um, and most importantly, what is missing in the statute is we don't have a plan to get there. If we have any hope of putting ourselves on a path towards climate stability, we need to know where we are headed. Um, the analogy I remember Dr. Hansen and Pushkar Karecha, who's a scientist who works with him, were trying to figure out as scientists how do they communicate the urgency of the climate crisis and that we need to draw down emissions there. And they were going back and forth. And the one analogy that came up was weight loss, is that if you need to lose 50 pounds, um, it's, pro it's probably not a good idea to wait to lose the 50 pounds until 10 days before you're supposed to have the weight off, right? It's probably a good idea to start as soon as you can because then it makes it much more reasonable for you to get there. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, for example, when we filed our petition in 2014, the numbers were about 4% of reductions per year, a very feasible, feasible, reasonable amount. Today, we're talking about 8% per year. And we're very getting to, close to the point where the emissions reductions will need to be so significant that we likely won't have an opportunity or a chance to do that. And that's why we're at this very critical point in history to put ourselves on the trajectory. And frankly, it's a place that humanity will not find itself again. Um, and is one of the reasons why the youth are taking the lead in asking that the greenhouse gas emission reductions occur today in a manner as what's required by science. Um, and so part of the statute is directing ecology to use their existing statutory authority uh, to ensure that we are on track to meet the targets. And I very much hear what was said about accountability and transparency. And what we're asking is that ecology every year announce to the public where we are. Are we on track to meeting our emission targets? What else needs to be done? And so we're asking them to do that. They're already required to track progress, but they're not required, required to report that to us on an annual basis. Um, and finally, the other part that is, um, we're asking is that we eliminate an exception for the industrial combustion of biomass in the form of fuel, wood, wood waste, wood byproducts, and wood residuals. Frankly, we don't have time for exceptions um, for certain greenhouse gas emitters. We just don't. Everybody needs to take responsibility and accountability, including us, um, as individuals for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so we're asking that that exception be removed. And we're asking that ecology start taking into account carbon sequestration measures because we cannot solve the crisis by reducing our greenhouse gas emissions alone. We need to figure out ways how to sequester the carbon into our trees and our soils. And that's already a part of the existing statute, but it's something that has not yet been implemented. So I think one thing that w where we want to be very clear is we believe ecology has a lot of the legal tools it needs to get the job done. We've been asking them to use those tools since we first filed our case in 2011. It's been five years, and we still are hoping that ecology will come to the plate, use their existing authority to protect the rights of young people, and to do their actions based on best available science. I'm happy to answer any questions about the legislation. I would like to ask you a question. Um, Ashley and I were talking a little bit about this beforehand, namely that if you get the opportunity to talk to power, to talk to the blue, if they, if you get a positive answer from the letter that you read from Warehouse and so on, what are you going to tell them, and how are you going to react if you get patronized and patted on the head and thanked thank for your idealism and shown the door? Well, I. Uh, what we get a chance to say, uh, if we get a chance to talk to them, uh, we would like to plan with them and try to find a plan that not only fits current climate science, but will also help them sort of keep on being good for business, trying to make it so that they're happy, but we get what we want. If we get head on the back, patronized, we've done the door, like we said, we're not going to be happy. Let me put it this way. We are going to go to the media, we're going to tell them what happened, and they're going to get a lot of outrage. 
uh, because if this word spreads like we want it to, uh, then they won't really have much of a choice but to listen to us. A quick follow-up on that. Uh, there is a very, very interesting day down on the Duwamish River uh, where large numbers of immigrant Americans uh, fish for food that, you know, fish that have heavy metals in them and so on. The Duwamish Valley Youth Corps, which does clean up work down there, has been in regular contact with Mayor Murray and has had regular sessions with him and so on, uh, expressing his commitment to environmental justice. I'm interested to what extent your group and others have had personal contact with the governor. Um, well, with the governor, we've had long meeting. Uh, we've had a long meeting with him, and we've spoken to his department of ecology. Um, his response was not very good. I mean, yeah, he listened to us in the meeting, and you know, he really seemed like he understood. But then he basically told the department of ecology to make a rule that they wanted to do, which meant that the judge couldn't order them to make a rule based on the current climate science, and that they could just. They basically just made a squishy rule, which come back to court, and the judge did now uh, was now able to order them to make one. But the experience we've had with Governor Inslee has not been good. It's been against us, and that's why we're taking this into our own hands. He's the greenest governor, and if he's not going to help us, who is? We're going to have to. And then Patrick, I see you've got a question next. Um, I actually uh, haven't been in any of the personal meetings with the governor. Uh, well, I've been in one. Um, and it was uh, that very nice uh, political kind of the, the thing every politician puts on. Like, yes, I'm here and I'm listening. Um, but this is, also, this is also part of my job. Um, and so afterwards, there wasn't much results. Uh, there wasn't much to expect. Uh, I mean, he's a nice guy. Uh, he didn't do what we needed him to do uh, at the end of the day. And I'll, I'll just follow up on that as well. Is that's part of the reason that we are here. It was our hope. We asked Ecology to consult and to confer with us as the court ordered them to do on what the recommendation to the legislature should be. We offered them an opportunity to meet not only with the youth, but with our scientific experts, including Dr. Hansen, um, so that we could go over what we believe to be the best available climate science. They were not interested in meeting with us to discuss the science or the substance of the recommendation. They were only willing to discuss the timing of when it was going to be submitted to the legislature. And frankly, whether it's submitted in November or December is of no consequence to us. We are more concerned with the substance. And that is why we took it upon ourselves to draft legislation. It is our hope and our expectation that they will recognize this is what the current science requires and that this is what ecology will adopt and endorse when they make their recommendation to the legislature. And we hope to work with them every step of the way on that if they let us do that with them. Patrick? Question for both uh, Andrea and Jill. The governor's, uh, the, the, the proposed uh, rule from ecology would allow 100% of emitters' obligations to be met by trading on the offset market. Uh, I'm wondering what your concerns about that might be. Yeah, my concerns with that is, you know, essentially it makes your pollution somebody else's problem. I think we're to the point where the reductions need to be so extensive that direct regulation and reduction of your emissions needs to occur. And that is the reason why the youth are engaging in this endeavor to directly ask the corporations to reduce their emissions because ecology isn't doing that by the clean air rule. So instead the youth are taking it upon themselves to ask the different corporations to come up with a plan to reduce their own emissions. So we're extremely disappointed 
that offsets were such a big part of the rule and recognize that there needs to be some sort of flexibility when it comes to compliance, but we strongly believe that direct regulation uh, from the source is what's required to get us where we need to go. I think we've got um, two more questions here, and then we might have to um, move, move along. Sorry, Jill. Um, but yeah, we'll take Bellamy and then Martha, and then if I have no more questions. Yes, I wanted to comment on that because we had also uh, met um, uh, with the governor a couple of months ago, and it became apparent that the clean air rule was full of carbon trading and, and market based mechanisms and not actual um, um, procedures of how do we reduce um, emissions at the source. Um, and we are you know, in conversation with other communities of color uh, and climate justice groups around the country. Um, and you know, the idea that you know, companies can pass you know, the buck to another area or you know, not in my backyard kind of thinking is not, is not in solidarity with the others. Like we, we want Washington to be a healthier state um, but not at the, at the risk of another community um, being thrown under the bus. Um, I've been in talks with folks in California and folks in the Northeast um, in which the Washington State wants to connect to their um, trading. Uh, um, uh, and, and yet, you know, we do not see this as a solution. We see it as a false promise and another way of uh, companies um, moving, like not taking responsibility for what they need to do to reduce emissions. And so, um, really, we are um, emphasizing um, a reductions at the source, reductions on site, um, with a priority on that, um, and then reinvestments in those areas um, those that need it the most. And so, making sure that those communities have um, are, are involved in the process of what is uh, what is going to reduce emissions. And we're learning from California a lot. There's a, a lot of powerful legislation that was passed this year. Um, and also a, a program, a reinvestment um, that allowed communities to determine what are the projects that would reduce emissions in their communities. And that, that is what's really um, reducing um, pollution and, redu and reducing emissions in their communities, is community-led projects. So I just wanted to share that um, and that there are a lot of solutions out there and that we should look for them and we should be in solidarity with other communities around the country and around the world. So, um, Andrea, if you could please comment. Um, you, you mentioned that the current goal is 8% per year reduction. How far off the mark is the current rule that ecology has? I mean, are they, can you give us some comparison in terms of numbers? Yeah, um, I certainly can. And we have a chart that we can make available that shows the current rule, um, if implemented as expected, and anticipated, it would only result in emissions that do not achieve the existing statutory greenhouse gas emission limits. The one, the emission limits that are outdated and not based on science. So the, if the rule is not targeted to achieve these 2008 limits, it is very far from achieving where we need to go based on science. And we have a graphic that we can, we can produce that you can see how the trajectories are so different. And it's my understanding the rule will require reductions of around 1 to 1.7 percent per year. And our scientists have opined that it needs to be more along the lines of 8 percent per year. So it's a significant difference. Starting and that's eight percent as if we were starting immediately. It very quickly goes to ten percent. Yes, also for Andrea. So you're proposing this legislation. Is there precedence in a nonprofit or a law center um, actually proposing kind of this kind in in a, in, a, in a similar way, proposing actual legislation outside of it coming from a representative or a, or a senator? Well, we would need to find a sponsor for the legislation. So that, that's in the works. Yeah, that's that's in the works. But it's my understanding there's a few elections that need to happen before that process can be done. But we're certainly doing our outreach. And what I think is most important for the legislatures is for those of who were not around in 2008, an education of the history 
of how we came to be where we are today is exceptionally important. So the youth will be engaging with legislators. And like I said, our hope is that we can go to the legislatures holding hands with Ecology and Governor Inslee, um, as I think that would make the chances of the legislation, legislation passing that much more strong. So this is a month-long month project. Oh, absolutely. The legislative session starts in January, but uh, there's a lot of work that needs to happen before then. I think that's maybe all we have time for, for questions, so that we get a fewer in time. We do have one more speaker. Um, just on that, Andrea, one thing I haven't told you is I received an email this morning from a representative inviting you for coffee. Hey! Good. <laughs> Um, our final speaker, um, who is going to close us out um, and invite us all to join us, there is a mailbox less than half a block away, um, so I believe after our final speaker says his words, you're, you're, you're going to be asked to join us to walk half a block. And our final speaker is the former president uh, of Plant for the Planet, and 16-year-old uh, Ajay Piper is also one of the youth plaintiffs. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, Alec. Um, so, as you heard, I'm Aji. Um, I'm 16 years old. I've been a climate activist here in Seattle since I was 11. Um, I, I have a letter to read for you guys real quick, um, just, like, just like Gabe had his letter. My letter is to uh, Kimberly Harris, who is the CEO of Puget Sound Energy. I said, Dear Kimberly Harris, do you know what climate change is? Do you really know what climate change is? Ask yourself this question. If the answer is yes, then you have a responsibility to do what's right. It's generally accepted that the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility, is true. It is also accepted that knowledge is power. So if you have knowledge, I ask you to take responsibility by reducing your business's carbon em dioxide emissions by 8 to 10% every year. This is a figure that is supported by top researchers and scientists around the world. And I am also backed by Our Children's Trust, Plant for the Planet, and 350 Seattle. We have the ability to help you implement these reductions in a way that is still business friendly but also gets the job done. I strongly urge you to meet with us so that we can make plans to save my future. It's very, very important that these corporations listen to this. We're asking them to make these uh, reductions and regulate themselves because one, it takes a long time in courts to get these governments uh, to do these things. You, they're so pedantic about it. They're like, oh, but we can write this loophole in, and we can write that loophole in. We can do this and that to get around this. And we've seen this time and time again. We've seen governments completely defy what we're trying to get them to do. So we're, now we're asking the corporations, just, hey, can you please just, I know it's going to be hard. I know that we're asking for the moon. I know that that's like such an unreachable goal, but wait. J.F. Kennedy asked for the moon, he got it. So why can't we children ask for the moon? But the moon was optional. Our rights and obligations are not. So I urge you to tell every child you know about this. I urge you to look up, and I will, we will find a way to get you names of these corporations' uh, CEOs. And I want you to, to get these children and youths to write letters, because this is a very important thing, the most important letter they will probably ever write in their life. This is a letter to save their own futures. This is a letter to save my future. Thank you. And I would like you guys to join me um, in mailing all these letters uh, to these corporations today. Thank you, Aji. Um, yes, thank you, every, uh, everyone, very much for coming along, and thank you once again to Reverend Moe and everyone at First Church. 
Uh, the mailbox is just half a block. We go out the main doors and walk up the street. Uh, we have uh, a large number of letters and we invite any young people um, in the crowd to help us mail these letters. Um, so we will just make our way slowly to the mailbox, which is on the first corner, less than half a block away. Thank you.